Hello everyone and welcome back to our series on energy modeling fundamentals with Honeybee. And in the previous video, we looked at some of these hourly plots of various things going on in our, our energy simulation of this single family home. And we came to a pretty good understanding of where these energy use values are coming from. We know at least that Energy Plus is doing this hourly calculation to be able to show us plots like this. But we didn't necessarily get so deep as to understand why, why the energy use really is the way that it is. And maybe even better yet, what should be our next strategy as we go and try and change things on this single family home energy model that we're working on. So in this episode, we're going to cover energy balances, which are, are basically the answer to that question of why is the energy use the way that it is. And in order to understand energy balances, we have to go all the way back to something very fundamental, which is the basis of all energy modeling. And when I say the basis of all energy modeling, I really mean the first law of thermodynamics. So did you guys know that you guys are going to get a physics lesson in this tutorial today. So... All right, the first law of thermodynamics, I mean, I'm sure a number of you remember it, but uh, in case in case you forgot from high school physics, the first law of thermodynamics is that energy can never be created or destroyed. So it could only change form from one, one state to another. It can never actually truly be destroyed in any way or created in any way. And so what this means is that that all the energy that goes into a system eventually has to leave the system one way or another. And this goes for a range of things throughout physics, throughout life. I mean, that we can look at a very, very basic example. For me, like as a person, let's say that I eat a, an entire chocolate cake. So that is, those are like calories going into my system of my body. But then let's say I also go and then run a marathon. And that would be energy leaving the system. And so the thing is that those two things always need to be balanced in one way or another. That right, that the energy of that chocolate cake is never going to be destroyed or created in any way. It's got to leave the system in, in one way or another, whether that's me running a marathon or me teaching a video tutorial series. So essentially, and if those two aren't on bal in balance, then what's going to happen to me? Like, well, if I just ate a huge chocolate cake and I kept eating chocolate cake, well, you know, I'm going to die at a certain point, right? Because I've eaten too much cake. Or let's say I don't eat any cake and I just run a bunch of marathons. Eventually the same thing happens there, right? So this, there, the energy going into a system always has to equal the energy leaving a system. So I'm sure at this point you're saying, okay, what does this actually have to do about buildings? Well, let's just replace the system of myself or the, generally the word system with building. And you essentially have what's going on under the hood of every single energy calculation engine uh, that exists right now. So essentially, the calculation that's being performed is that all the energy that goes into our building, let's say it goes into our single family home, eventually has to leave the building one way or another. And if it doesn't leave the building, then the building's not going to necessarily be in the same thermal conditions, it's the same temperature as it would be otherwise. So we can map out the different terms of the building on this, this equation of equality. So the energy that goes into buildings, some of the things that may put our energy into our buildings would be things like heat from people or heating from computers or from appliances or, or from light bulbs or the solar heat gain through windows. All of these are going to add heat to the inside of our building. At the same time, heat is going to be leaving our building in, under typical conditions. You know, if it's colder outside than inside, then heat is going to be conducting through the walls and the roof to the outside. You're going to get some heat loss from cooler air potentially seeping through the walls, or even heat loss through ventilation, purposefully done ventilation that you're bringing into the building. And again, these all these terms that are heat loss can easily switch to the other side if, if those outdoors are warmer than the indoors, and these can actually become things that add heat to the building. But importantly, that if these two things are not balanced, then our building is not going to be at a stable temperature. It's either going to be getting warmer if there's too much on this side and not enough on this side, or it's going to be getting colder if there's too much energy leaving the building and not enough going into it. And so the way that we're actually calculating the amount of heating or cooling that we need for this single family home in our energy model is that those heating and cooling terms are just the remainder of whatever happens at the end of this calculation. Whatever, whatever is not equal at that point, that is then absorbed by either a heating system or a cooling system. And this is all that it is. In a very basic sense, all energy calculation engines are just running this same equality calculation that is the first law of thermodynamics over and over again for at least every hour of the year. Energy Plus, usually we're doing it every 10 minutes or so. And over that, the whole year, you get a decent sense of what the actual energy use of the building would be. So, all right. So now that we understand the fundamental principle of all 
building energy modeling. Let's try and, and visualize this equation a little bit more easily. And we do that typically through some type of, of energy balance graphic like what you see here. So we can take each of those terms that are either removing heat or adding heat to the building, and we can plot them as either positive or negative bars on a chart. And as you guys might have already intuited, the heat that is being added to the building always has to equal the heat that is being removed from the building, at least over long periods of time, like a month or so. You should generally find that these two are equal to one another. That goes to the case whether you're in the winter or in the summer, the energy gain equals the energy loss. The really nice thing about a visualization like this, though, is that I can now ask a question like, why is this heating energy use so high for this particular energy model that produced this energy balance? And I'll give you guys a few seconds to look at this and you can tell me why. And I'll ask you another question at the same time. So if we understand why the heating energy use is the way it is, what would be the number one strategy that you'd recommend if you wanted to cut down this heating energy use? So I'll let you guys pause it, maybe take a second and answer those two questions, and I'll come back in a second to discuss it. Okay, so maybe some of you paused the video there, maybe some of you didn't, but you guys probably figured out relatively quickly that the reason why we have, the biggest reason why we have such a high heating load is that we have a lot of infiltration happening in this in this building here and that's the biggest heat loss term out of all of these other things that are removing heat from the space more so than glazing conduction more so than opaque conduction or mechanical ventilation these are the ones that are the infiltration is the big thing that that is causing this high heating load and so then if we were to ask ourselves what is the strategy that we should be applying in order to reduce this heating load well i think we should probably get out the weather stripping and the vapor barriers and the caulking and seal up all the little tiny cracks that we can in this building and that's probably going to give us the biggest bang for our buck maybe more so than any other strategy that we could implement in order to reduce this heating load after we've done that maybe we could start to consider some other things like the next kind of biggest term might be this glazing conduction we might consider improving the windows a little bit if we want to get that heating down load down a little bit more and essentially want to improve the u value of those windows so that we get heat, less heat loss from them in the middle of the winter so hopefully you can already get a sense of how useful it is to look at an energy balance like this let's look at another Actually, there's a lot that you can learn from an energy balance. The first thing I would ask you guys is, where in the world is this is the building that produced this energy balance located? You probably already figured it out. This is in the southern hemisphere because we can tell that the, the cooling is happening in the middle of January and February, whereas the heating is happening in July. This is actually in Sydney, Australia, I'll say. And the building type, both both this and the previous building are residences. So the things that are driving the, the energy use have a lot more to do with things like the envelope. But if we had to pick one strategy that we really wanted to invest in to reduce this cooling energy use in Sydney, it would probably be get invest in some shading, maybe some big overhangs for these windows, because we are getting a lot of solar gain through these windows. That's very much so contributing to this, this cooling load that we see in January and February and March here. So, all right, so that's another case. Let's look at one more so that you guys can get a sense of how different energy balances can be. And I would ask you to guess what type of building this is, but I'm sure it would take a few guesses to come around to it. Maybe one big hint, if you guys know the building types well, there's a huge term here for mechanical ventilation. So we know this is not any normal type of program. This is definitely not a residence. It's not an office. And if you know your building types well, you might have guessed that this is actually a hospital. <laughs> So the reason why we have such high ventilation loads in hospitals is that we're, we're really pumping a lot of air into those places in order to do infection control. So there's really no way around that. We need to, to pump in a lot of air, and we can't necessarily lessen that without putting patients in danger. So what that means, though, is that if we wanted to pick one strategy in this building that would really mitigate the energy use, we definitely want to go after this mechanical ventilation term more than anything else, right? It really doesn't matter. We can in some better windows or shading but we can see how small the solar term is in relation to the whole building here so if we're going to invest in one thing it should be something that that mitigates this ventilation load and if you guys are familiar with heat recovery technologies which essentially just put the inlet stream of air right next to the outlet stream so that they can exchange heat without actually exchanging air something like that in a hospital setting is going to dramatically reduce the energy use more so than any other strategy you can pick so you guys can see already how the energy balance really helps you prioritize and, and helps you pick your battles of what you should really fight for in your projects. 
So, all right, let's get back to our single family home and actually construct an energy balance for our, our single family home here. And you can see that we already have most of these terms already ready to go. We have the cooling, the heating, the lighting, and electric equipment. And because we requested these gains and losses, we have things like solar gain and people gain. So first things first, maybe I will just uh, turn the preview off on this hourly plot here. And you know what? Actually, I'm going to delete it for now. I don't think we really need it. We'll, we'll maybe come back to it at a later point. But the critical thing that I want to do and to be able to construct an energy balance is that I need to bring all of these streams of data together and essentially add them up, add and subtract them together. And there's a nifty component that helps you do this called the HP thermal load balance. And so what this one does is you still have to put in the rooms or, or a model that you simulated here and then plug in each of the individual streams of data for these different terms of the load balance. But in the end, it'll give you this nice single list of, of, of energy balance terms that you can then visualize on something like the bar chart that, that you saw in those previous graphics. So, all right, I'm going to go over to my model that I plugged into my energy simulation to begin with and set that as the rooms model here. I'm going to connect the cooling to the cooling, the heating to the heating, lighting to lighting. Let's see, we've got electric equipment, and we, we basically just want to go through all of these terms. You don't have gas or, or process equipment, but we do have hot water. We do have people adding heat into the space, right? There's body heat that people are giving off. We do have solar gain. We do have infiltration, uh, adding and removing heat. We have some ventilation. We don't have any natural ventilation in this model, so we can just leave that out for now. But importantly, we need this last term, which has the, the energy flow across the individual faces, across the windows and walls. Uh, and the easy way we can get that, you, you'll notice we actually requested this when we requested surface energy flow back here, but we didn't yet bring this into Grasshopper. So we have a dedicated component to help us with this. It's called read, HB read face result. And I'm going to drop this onto my canvas. And you'll see it takes the SQL file, and I can just connect that up to here. And it'll give us out the face energy flow, which if I connect to a panel here, I just want you guys to understand, we actually get a list of data collections. So whereas for cooling and heating, we were only getting one data collection because we have only one room in our model. For the face energy flow, we're actually getting 14 different data collections here each for the different types of surfaces in the model. So one of these data collections is for the roof, four of them are for the walls, a few of the others are for windows. So it, you can essentially delve down deep into the energy flow of individual surfaces using this data. But right now I'm just gonna take it and plug it straight into the face energy flow here. And you'll see out of this component, if I pull a panel back up, you'll see that we get a balance out of this component, which is again, just a list of data collections but in this case, we have one data collection for each and every term of the load balance. And a really nice way that we can visualize these terms is to connect them up to a ladybug visualization called the LB monthly chart. So I'm going to drag and drop this LB monthly chart on the canvas here. And I'm going to connect up the balance data. And you'll see if I go over to Rhino scene and top view, we get a pretty decent uh, view of what's going on here. We have all these terms for cooling, window conduction, ventilation, but they're kind of all previewing on top of each other here, and they're also previewing on top of the, the building. So I'm going to go over to the building here and turn the preview off on our color face attributes. I'll do preview off there. And in order to make sure that each of these individual terms of the load balance aren't showing up on top of each other, I'm going to set this stack input of this monthly chart to true. So I'm going to double click, bring up a Boolean toggle, and type true, and the, connect that to stack. And here we go. This is a little clearer. We can see, essentially, this is showing us in each month what is the profile over the course of the day. And we see that we have a heating load that peaks in the morning and drops, uh, basically, and comes back up at the end of the day. Uh, we have things like a, uh, let's see, a cooling term in the summer. We could probably use some better colors here to help us more easily identify what these different terms are. And, in, and we can easily do that using legend parameters. You'll see that the monthly chart has a legend parameter input here, all the way at the bottom. And uh, in order to set this up, we can just grab these LB legend parameters here. I'm going to drag and drop those onto the canvas. 
And I'm going to select some colors. We actually have a nice color scheme that's already set up to work with, with energy balances, which you can get by easily dropping this LB color range component on the canvas. And you see this just takes an index for a certain color scheme that you'd like to use. And we have one, I believe, that is called energy balance. Yes, or, or even this energy balance with storage. Uh, that seems useful. So I'm going to plug a 19 in for the index here by just double clicking in the canvas, typing double quotes and hitting 19. We connect that to index. And then we connect the colors that we get uh, as a result of that to the legend parameters. And finally, the legend parameters to the monthly chart. And we should see this looks a little better. Uh, you can see the little brown color is maybe not exactly what we wanted for cooling. Maybe I can change this to 18 so that we can uh, get, a, get a visualization that actually has dark blue for cooling. But in general, we can get a, a sense of what's really going on, uh, on with, the, with the load balance over the course of this building. Honestly, though, this is not quite as clear as if we just had a nice monthly bar chart like in those other screenshots I showed you earlier. So in order to do that, what we can simply do is take these hourly data collections and convert them into monthly data collections. And there's an easy component that allows you to do this. It's just called LB time interval operation. And if you drop this onto the canvas, it allows you to take a data stream of hourly data and get it on a either on a daily, a monthly, or a monthly per hour basis. So the monthly is, is probably the key one that we'd like here. If I connect up our balance data to our da uh, to our, our data of our time interval operation, and then I connect up the monthly data to our bar chart here, yeah, this is looking a lot more intuitive. Uh, okay, great. So we can actually really clearly see that in this model, now that we know what all these different terms mean, if I were to pick we, you know, we realized before, right, that the heating load was more than we expected for a house in Southern California. Usually Southern California is cooling dominated. And we can kind of understand now the reason why this single family home has such a high heating load. We can answer that question for ourselves and understand that, okay, it's actually because of the infiltration. So that's why, that's why it's so high. And we could probably also intuit maybe the reason why the infiltration is so high is that this, this building has a really high surface area to volume ratio. There's a lot of surface area from which you could, you could lose heat. And maybe that's also a big reason why our opaque conduction term is so large. So already off the bat, we have a really good strategy for what we should target if we want to improve this single family home. Especially if my mother-in-law is going to do a renovation of the single family home, uh, if there's one thing I could really recommend to her is, is to really make sure that we seal up the holes and cracks in a house like this as much as possible because it has such a high surface area to volume ratio. Maybe I'll just show you guys one other thing, which is this normalized balance with storage. So right now we're just looking at, at the total number of kilowatt hours for each month. But it's often a lot nicer to look at the, the energy intensity in kilowatt hours per square meter instead of just the sum total kilowatt hours. So that's what this norm bal, it's floor normalized balance here. And you can see that the numbers are a little bit more close to what we'd expect. And if you summed it up over all these months here, you get something closer to our total EUI here, which is 184 kilowatt hours per square meter. And you can also add an extra storage term, which I can show you this quickly. All that's going to do is that I'm going to add, use the normalized balance with storage, and I'm going to change the color range to be 19 instead of 18. And you'll see that whatever is left over, whatever is not perfectly balanced, will get labeled in this, in this brown color. And usually this term should be very small. We can see there's a very, very little bit that, that we're getting in some of these months. But this is usually a good sanity check to make sure that the simulation is truly balanced and that you've connected up all the inputs that you wanted here. So, all right, so I know this was a little bit of a longer episode, but I can tell you there is almost nothing as informative as an energy balance when you are trying to prioritize what strategies you should investigate for a building. And I really hope that you guys walk away from this video with a bit of a sense of this. But just in case you didn't, we're actually going to spend the next video covering energy balances as well. And I'm going to give, show you a few shortcuts for actually evaluating the energy balance of your models as you create them. Because this is, admittedly was a little bit of an involved process to connect everything up here. So if you guys stick around in the next video, you'll see a bit of a shortcut workflow for getting to this, this point of looking at energy balances. Thank you again for making it through this somewhat longer video, and I hope to see you in the next one.